Example 162. Find the least squares prediction line for the following pre-owned Corvette data. So we have the age of the Corvette, right? And we have the price of the Corvette in thousands of dollars. So this is $27,000, $26,000. Twenty-seven and a half thousand dollars, forty thousand five hundred, you know, so on and so forth, right? Okay, so we have the information in the problem. They asked us to find the least squared prediction line, so that means we need to estimate the slope. So we need to come up with a formula for, if you remember, beta one hat, which remember is the sum of squares for x y divided by the sum of square for x x. So that's what we need to do for that, and then we also need to come up with the y-intercept estimator, so we're going to have in that case y-bar minus the slope estimator times x-bar. So these are the two formulas we need to fill in, and to do those two formulas we need to come up with these guys, right? The sum of square for xy, sum of square for xx. To do that we're going to need to use, for the first one, the sum of xy minus the sum of x times the sum of y and both of those divided by the sample size n. Then for the second one, the SSXX, we're going to need to have the summation of x squared minus the sum of x quantity squared over n. Okay, so those are the formulas we need to use. We have all this data, we have to crunch the numbers in order to be able to come up with these values. I didn't think there'd be much gained by doing that in front of you on here, so what I've done is I've gone ahead and done the work ahead of time. And I'll explain what I did so you can rec you know, recreate that yourselves, but I didn't think you needed to see me typing all these numbers into a calculator. So what I've done here, if you look at the work I've done, I've basically uh, come up with the uh, ages and price data, which they had, and I just put it in two columns. I added the age column together to get the sum of x, that gave me 40. I added all the numbers in the price column together to give me the sum of y. So I have those two totals. I need those in my formula, right? All right, then from there I had to square all the x's, so I did 6 squared, 6 squared, 5 squared, so on and so forth, and I summed all the results to get the sum of x squared. And then finally the last thing I did was I multiplied both the x and the y together and produced this column of products, and then I added them all up to get the sum of x times y. So I think you can do that yourselves, but that's what I've done there, basically. All right, so now that I have that, my next goal then is to simply come up with one number that I'm going to need that isn't included in those totals, and that is the sample size. So what is n in this problem? Well, if you look carefully at how many ordered pairs we started with, we had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We have 10 different numbers in our list, 10 different ordered pairs, I should say, and so those are the number, that's the number n that we need for the problem. Okay, so let's plug in the numbers now to work these things out. When you look at the first one, it's the sum of xy. The sum of xy is 1,207.3 minus the sum of x times the sum of y, that's 40 times 322.2, 40 times 322.2 all over 10, which is our sample size. All right, we're gonna work that out in a minute with a calculator. Let's fill in this one next though. The sum of x squared, well the sum of x squared is 188, minus the sum of x quantity squared, so that'll be 40 squared, and then divide by n, which is 10. All right, let's work those out now in our calculator and see what we come up with here. Okay, so for the first one, it's 1207.3 minus 40 times 322.2 divided by 10. All right, and when you do that, you get negative 81.5, right? Negative 81.5. Please remember that that number can be negative because it's the mixed term xy. It's allowed to be negative. This one cannot be negative, so if we get the next one is ne as negative, we made a mistake, right? All right, so 40 squared divided by 10, and our result is 28. And of course, it's positive as it should be. All right, these two numbers then are to be used in our next step. Our next step is to simply take those two numbers and plug them into the formula for the slope. So beta 1 half will be the first one, negative 81.5, the mixed term, sum of square xy, divided by the x term. Remember the x term always goes at the bottom. And let's see what that gives us as our answer then. So we'll have minus 81.5 divided by 
the number we just had, which is 28, and we get negative 2.911. So rounding three decimal places after the decimal point, we get a negative 2.911. All right, now from there, I should come up with our y-intercept value. For this, I need to come up with the average y and the average x. This is the things, the only things I haven't calculated quite yet. But those are easy to come up with because if we have the sum of x, we just divide it by the number of values we had. And for the same for the sum of y. So in other words, it'll be 322.2 divided by 10. That's going to give you y bar minus the slope, which is a negative 2.911. Remember, these negative negatives will become a positive here. The x bar is going to be 40 divided by 10, all right? Of course, you know, you could just put in 4 here, and here, you know, if you divide by 10, you're just moving the decimal place over one place, so it would be 32.22. You know, you could put that in that way, or you can put it in the way I've done it. It doesn't make a difference, right? Your calculator will handle the work anyways. All right, so let's take our information and plug it in. Now, we're going to have 322.2 divided by 10 plus... 2.911. Now, you could have left the whole thing in there if you wanted to, so you don't have any rounding. Um, in this case, you know, it's okay. I think we'll be fine. And I'm just going to do times four. We've given it enough decimal places. I don't think that little difference is going to make a huge difference in the final answer. But if you're never, if you're uncertain, you can, you know, go ahead and put in, um, if you want, you can go ahead and put in more decimal places for the slope so you're not rounding until the very end. That's really the proper way to do it, but you know, just for this demonstration, it's okay to do a little rounding. All right, so we have beta 1, we have beta 1 naught. So from there, sorry, we have beta 1 and beta naught. And what we're going to do now is going to plug them in. And remember what the hat means here. So beta 1 hat means it's an estimator of the true slope and beta naught hat is an estimator of the y-intercept, right? We don't have the actual values, but we have an estimator based on our sample data. All right, let's take this uh, model then and fill it in. Remember, the model is going to be the intercept plus the slope times the x value. So for us, that means we're going to have the intercept of 43.864 plus a minus, so we're just going to say minus then, 2.9. 1, 1 times x. Remember what x is here? x is going to represent the age of the car in years, right? How old the car is. And then y is going to represent the price in thousands of dollars. So what I want to do next is actually answer the second question here, which is example 163. In other words, I want to use this model to make a prediction, right? I want to know what the average price would be for a Corvette that was three years old. So. One thing I want to point out here is that it's good to make this prediction with three years because that's a number between our range of years that we use to create the model. I wouldn't want to put 10 in here or 20 in here, right? The reason why is if I put 10 or 20, that's outside of the x values that I had that created the model. Maybe something weird happens in the data out at those points. Maybe when a car gets much older, it becomes more of a collector's item and the depreciation stops and maybe begins to reverse. Maybe the car actually begins to appreciate, right? So we don't want to put numbers well outside of this range. In other words, our model is, is going to be good or fine for, say, one to six years. But I wouldn't want to start plugging in numbers like 10 in the model because that number is outside of the range of x values used to create it. And it could be that the pattern in the data is quite different at that point. So try to use a number that's within your range. 3 is perfectly within the range, so I think it's going to be a good choice. So we're just going to plug in 3 years, right, right into there, and that should give us an answer for the problem that we asked in 63. So in example 163, what I'm going to do is take that 43.864 minus 2.911 times 3. And what it predicts is 35.1, let's say, if we just round it off. So in this case, the result will be for x equals to 3, we get that y is equal to 35.1. And what does that mean? It means the same as what? That a 3-year-old Corvette should sell roughly on average for $35,100, right? That's the basic idea of the problem, right? Because this is in thousands of dollars. So we're saying that a 3-year-old Corvette 
on average should sell for $35,100. Of course, the only thing this model is considering is age, right? And so this average is what, averaging across all the different conditions, the different colors, the different options that are on the car, you know, all those different qualities that would make the price be different is gonna mean that this is only the average price. Obviously, a car in better shape would probably be above average in price, a car in worse shape would be below average, right? A car with an excessive amount of miles would be below average, a car with less miles would be above average, but this is roughly what we're predicting the average price to be for a three-year-old Corvette. And that's it.